conclave that we had today was uh, set in the backdrop of, of course, the UK <coughs> elections. Last year, it was in the backdrop of the Indian elections, and uh, my timing is absolutely impeccable given the sorts of issues that are being discussed at this particular election in terms of wealth, non-doms, mansion tax, all those sorts of things. And we had a very, very robust set of discussions throughout the course of uh, today. The reception today is a, is a celebration of all that's great about the UK uh, and India relationship. And ab I believe that above all, the two things that um, bring us together is our common uh, love for culture and our democratic traditions. India being, of course, the largest democracy in the world, and the UK being the oldest democracy and the mother of parliaments being uh, in Westminster. And that really binds us in terms of our values and our vision and indeed our aspirations for the future. A big thank you to Manoj and everybody that's uh, helped organise uh, this event. Let me just say a few words about BDO because, um, as Manoj mentions, uh, we're paying for the drinks, so the price of that <laughs> is for you to listen. And uh, for anybody that knows me, I really enjoy my statistics. So the statistics about BDO are pretty straightforward. We are a $7 billion uh, revenue professional services firm in 150 countries with 60,000 people. The key statistics uh, is there's about 160,000 Indian nationals who are classed as high net worth in uh, individuals. That's $600 billion uh, of wealth looking for a home. And of course, I'd like to think off of the back of today, they also look at uh, the UK as a really positive, uh, both culturally and historically and progressively, a place to engage with professionals and people who will do business. I have to say I feel a little bit like a fish out of water here. Um, as, uh, as you heard, my, my career has been very much in the public sector. I've never worked for anybody who's tried to make a profit out of anything. Um, <laughs> so when I'm asked to come and speak at a, at a, at a wealth, uh, wealth um, management uh, uh, event, uh, I, I, wealth management to me sounds like a very good idea in theory, but it's not something I've ever had the uh, pleasure to try to um, uh, put into practice my, myself. So when a call came out of the blue, uh, which suggested that, uh, that Prime Minister Modi, as he then was, uh, wanted uh, or thought it might be a good idea to have a book written by a Westerner about his uh, election campaign, and might I perhaps be interested in being considered uh, for, for that, and um, it came as a, as a, a shock and a, a surprise to me. Uh, I was told that uh, he'd read one of my earlier books about working for Tony Blair, uh, which I thought actually was a bit of sort of flattery and a bit of soft soap yeah. to try and get me interested. And then Manoj told me recently that actually it was absolutely true, and he had, to, he had seen one of, one of my books. But as soon as I asked the first question about the campaign, he was off, and he was telling stories of one sort or another, and... and uh, 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 all of them about this extraordinary campaign that he'd just fought, but he was still full of. And of course then he was already involved in, in uh, state elections that were very important to him, uh, and as we've seen, he's really been on the road ever since. He hasn't stopped since becoming, uh, since becoming Prime Minister. If he isn't uh, travelling around the country, uh, fighting elections uh, within India, and then he's travelling around the world, uh, selling India, uh, and being a, a superb ambassador for uh, his vision of a new India. Uh, it was interesting that um, uh, while this extraordinary campaign was going on in India, there were very, very few election observers from, from, uh, from the West uh, watching what was going on. Um, and uh, whereas when, you know, when there's an election in America, everyone from London who's remotely involved in politics piles over there to take part and vice versa. Um, but uh, apart from the Indian community, of course, both here and in the States, and the NRIs, who really did take a keen interest in what was going on, and some, like, of course, Manoj, actually took time off and made sure that they were there because they were aware that something really, really special was happening. Um, I think the rest of us, who were picking up bits and pieces through the media, weren't aware of, of, of what an extraordinary event it was, really, until it was over. Uh, and when it was over, it struck me that there was definitely a market there for someone to go and try to understand it from a Western perspective, explain uh, what had happened to a, to a wider audience, and I hope that's what the Modi effect uh, what seeks, to, seeks to do. Um, now, people will have different views as to how successful he's been, whether he hit the ground running, whether he's been a bit too slow, whether the budgets have done enough, um, but there's no doubt that he um, has the determination to 
uh, succeed. Um, and the final chapter in the book is called The Indomitable Will, which is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, who said that success comes from, above all, from having an indomitable will to succeed. And the one thing about Modi that I carried away from all my interactions with him is that he has this indomitable will to succeed. I don't think he considers failure an option. The, the first harsh reality is that as a, as a group, British Asians in particular, are not desperately philanthropic. Uh, we give, um, on a per capita basis, uh, something like a tenth of what comparable socioeconomic groups do. And so when I hear statistics about how much money we have, uh, it seems wrong that we, uh, that we don't unlock that giving potential. Uh, the biggest reason for that, uh, when you ask people why they don't give more, is trust, uh, or I should say a lack of trust. What we don't want to do is become another, another charity, because actually India doesn't need more charities. Uh, in fact, a statistic that always shocks me is that 96% of all charities set up in India disappear within three years. Uh, another stat that shocks me is that uh, we have more schools per capita in India than any other country in the world. The problem is that seven out of eight of them are disused. Uh, we have more hospitals per capita than any other country in, South, in, in Asia, but again, six out of eight uh, don't have the operating funds to, to run themselves. So what we've tried to do uh, is identify causes and spotlight causes which are perhaps a little bit taboo in country, um, and identify the best grassroots charities, and we give them, after much due diligence, the British Asian Trust kite mark to allow people like you to have trust in the giving. Uh, in terms of how you can help, uh, visit the website, um, tell your friends some of the stats that I've just given to you. And for those of you that have uh, listened to today's agenda about how to hoard your wealth, maybe think about giving some of it to the British Asian Trust. But we're going to be focused in three areas, rehabilitation, attacking the root causes, and impacting awareness. So thank you for uh, giving me five minutes at uh, today's session. Yeah. Mm-hmm.